I'm geeked. Good morning. Good afternoon. It's morning for me. It might be afternoon to you or whenever you're watching. And welcome to the Secret Place Pod with your bestie, Aaliyah Renee. Welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ of all ages and all walks of life to a safe space where we can be transformed, we can be vulnerable, and we can most importantly dwell and commune with the Lord. I'm super excited to have you all here. If you haven't read your Bible, we are going to read our Bibles today. So get your Bible, get your notes. We're going to have a good time. Today, I'm really excited because we are talking about the topic of the fact that there is a price for God's presence. And I think that this is really, really important for people who are on both sides of the spectrum. Um those who feel close to God right now and just want to stay close to him, what does it mean to be good stewards of his presence? Um, And also those who may be further from God, maybe there are certain heart postures that we need to change, certain things that we need to be reminded of um, in order to, you know, feel the potency of God's presence within us. But before we get started, bow your heads, close your eyes. We are going to pray. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit here. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to speak the good news of the gospel to your people, to be an encouragement and a light, oh Lord God, to those who know you or those who are curious or those who don't know you at all. Thank you for the listener that is on the other side of the screen, oh Lord God, you say where two or three are gathered in your name that you are here and we are gathered in your name. We wish to learn more about your wonders, oh God. We wish to learn more about you, Jesus. We wish to, oh Lord God, understand how we can make sure not to quench or grieve the spirit, but allow it to live and dwell within us. Oh, Lord Jesus, we recognize that when you left, you promised us this advocate. You promised us this mediator and this comforter in the Holy Spirit that we receive once we have salvation in you, Jesus. But we want to make sure that we are good stewards of the Holy Spirit, that we keep his influence potent in our lives, that, oh Lord God, that we don't hinder the Holy Spirit from speaking to us. Oh, Lord Jesus, I ask for those specifically who may feel like your presence is far from them as Christians, remind them that the Holy Spirit still dwells within them, looking for an opportunity to be put back on the forefront of their lives. Oh Lord Jesus, we repent where we have stifled the Holy Spirit or we have not been good stewards of your presence and where we may have diminished your influence and your presence in our lives. We repent, we do a 180, we turn back to you, O Lord God. We say, search our hearts for things that do not please you, that do not mix well with your presence, O Lord God. Show us and give us the courage and the grace, O Lord God, to remove those things and to invite you even stronger into our lives. Continue to be influences into our lives. Let us, O Lord God, make disciples of the earth. Let us go forth in boldness, knowing that you love us and that you are with us always and that you never leave or forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Woo. I'm excited. There's a lot. We got a lot to talk about. Um, This was a very fun study to do and something that is excuse me personally applicable to me that i'm super excited to chat with you all about as i had mentioned before this is definitely a conversation um and a study that is for people who already may feel close to the lord you're like i be with god every day we just be twinning them we be sticking together and maybe this is just a way to encourage you to continue walking with the Holy Spirit, to continue to allow him um, to stay potent in your lives through your posture of surrender to him. Um, or even those people who may feel far from the Lord, those who may feel like, even though I'm saved and I've received the Holy Spirit, I don't feel his influence or his presence as strongly on my life. Or maybe you're in between. You're like, I'm doing things that I don't think I should be doing that are hindering the presence of the Lord. This is for everybody. Um, And I hope that it is an an encouragement, but also a heart check and a place where we can hold ourselves accountable and line ourselves up according to the word, making sure we're in right standing with God and thus being good stewards of his presence. And I want to encourage the peeps. You know what I mean? Um, There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but there is conviction for us to do better. Um, and hold us accountable to continue to have this hunger to seek from the Lord. And the main reason that I want to illuminate this idea of the price of God's presence is that God really has a desire to be with his people, to dwell with his people. And I looked up the word of what it means to dwell. It means to live in or at a specified place. And we see this all throughout scripture of God dwelling with his people. For example, the children of Israel, 
even despite their disobedience and their murmuring, God dwelt with them in the form of in the wilderness. He stood with them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, walking with them as they walked throughout the wilderness um, and as they traversed to the promised land. And you can see that in Exodus 13. And then even after, years and years later, when the children of Israel finally get to the promised land that becomes Israel, he became man as Jesus and dwelt among us. In John 1, 1, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word being Jesus. He comes and dwells with us as a human being, fully God and fully man. And he dwells with us and teaches us how to live our lives. And then even after Jesus left, when he was crucified and he rose again on the third day with victory over sin and death, Jesus doesn't leave us alone. God still desires to dwell with us. So when Jesus leaves the earth, he promises us the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of God that now dwells within us as Christians. So God shows us in his word that never changes. He shows us his character and his desire to want to live and dwell with his people. So we can see that God is always wishing to be present. But again, the question is, are we receptive to his presence? Are we opening up a space that allows God to enter in and say, okay, I'm present in you. But God's presence doesn't just come with absence of change. Whenever God is there, he requires something of us. He requires us to listen when he speaks, as we spoke about in the last podcast episode. There's an importance to not just think, oh, God's going to be here and he's going to be just as strong as he was on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even if I'm not obeying his presence or I'm not being a good steward of his presence, we may feel further from God because although it was potent on like the first day of salvation or when you get the impartation of the Holy Spirit for the first time, but if we continuously do things that are not good stewards to the presence of God, it will be diminished. And I think that's where sometimes we may feel far from the Lord, even though he never really like ever abandons us as his children. There are times where we feel less of him because we're trying to do more of us. And I want to talk about that and remind us that there's an importance to be consecrated. There's an importance to stay pure or try our best to stay pure in order to make sure that we are paying the price for God's presence, this price of being as pure as we can following his commands and loving him and listening when he speaks so that his presence can stay heavy and potent on us the idea is that although the holy spirit will never leave us that presence of god will never leave us our actions our attitudes and the disobedience that we may have towards the things of the lord can hinder how strong he is this potency that he has and the closeness that we might feel with him And this is always a chance and an opportunity for us to just make sure we're checking our heart posture. Are we being people who are paying the price for God's presence? This pure price that the God of the universe wishes to dwell with us. Are we making sure that we are being good stewards of that presence? And if not, how can we get there? So I want to start by going back to the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament shows us that, again, like I said, God has wanted to dwell with his people since the beginning of time. And we see in the Old Testament, there were so many requirements for those few selected individuals that were called priests that were able to dwell with the presence of God. Um, And we see this especially in Exodus. So the children of Israel have now left Egypt and they are on their wilderness journey, going to the promised land. And as they progress in the wilderness, the God, God begins to speak to Moses, giving him the Ten Commandments and conduct. Essentially, like imagine... This is like building a country and civilization one-on-one. And God is speaking to Moses to then translate this to the people to say, okay, I know this is our first time really being a people and a collective body. And we've accepted that God is going to be our God. He's the I am that I am. And we we accept that he is our God. Now, what does that mean? How do we function? What are some of the things that we need to do? Like, imagine they had to build a whole new judicial system. They had to build a whole new, like, code of conduct. And that was all being led by God. Spoken to Moses. And Moses would then, again, relay that to the people. So one of the things that was important to establish within the children of Israel was to establish, okay, we need to have a place where God can dwell with us. This idea of God is present who is then able to be a good steward of God's presence and who can dwell with the Lord to hear from him. The earliest example of this being Moses. Moses, 
first interacts with God by seeing a burning bush and that's where the Lord is speaking to him and God gives him a requirement of entering into the presence he says take off your shoes for your entering holy ground so we're starting to see like to be in God's presence there are certain things that we you can't just come any type of way because this is the God of the universe so it comes contingent on a posture that you have to present a cleanliness of heart a pureness of heart um in order to enter into the presence of the Lord effectively so if we go to the cost of God presence and seeing that in Exodus if we go to Exodus 29 it shows us a little bit about what the cost was in quotes um for these individuals that God was going to set apart as priests so like these priests of Israel that those were the ones that were allowed to enter into God's presence what did it take for them to enter into God's presence our first ever priest that we see in the Bible so in Exodus chapter 29 I won't read you the whole chapter I'm just going to read you like the first couple of verses to show you what it took for an individual to be a priest and priests were the ones that were able to be in the presence of the Lord so if you go to Exodus 29 we can start at chapter one. Um, Exodus 29, we can start at verse one. It says, this is what you are to do to consecrate them, them being these Levites. And consecration being like, this is what you need to do before you become a priest, before you can enter into the presence. So there's this process of consecration, which is saying you can't come into the presence of God or dwell with God the same way that you were before. There's some sort of process that you need to do, a heart posture that you need to have in order to enter into the presence of the Lord. So we see that he calls them to be consecrated so that they can serve as priests. And just think that priest in this time, priests equal to people that can actually be in the presence of the God, of God. So let's go and see back in Exodus chapter 29 how these priests were set apart. So again, starting at verse 1, it calls for consecration. So not entering into the presence the same way that you were so that they may serve as my priests. So a bunch of things are happening. They're taking lambs and bulls and rams without defect. And from the finest wheat flour, make round loaves without yeast, thick loaves without yeast, and with oil mixed in, and thin loaves without yeast, and brushed with olive oil. Put them in a basket, present them along with the bull and the two rams. Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. So there's a washing and a cleansing of them. Take the garments and dress Aaron with a tunic, the robe of the ephod, and the ephod itself. So an ephod is basically like a... It's almost like a dressing so we can already see just five verses in there are animal sacrifices they had to be washed clean this was a seven day process you'll go on to read they had to eat food that was ordained by the lord they had to be dripped out in specific garments of the ephod and a certain breastplate that only priests could wear and all of this had to be done before they were called priests and entered into the presence of the lord so it's it's actually when i went back and saw this it's really sobering because we see that back in the day they did not play with the presence of the lord they had to come correctly and if they didn't as it says in exodus 30 there was a contingency of actual death like they would die if they did not enter correctly into the presence of the lord and just seeing that i would ask myself like are you when you wish to pray or wish to be close to the lord are you making sure that at least your heart posture is right like these people are killing rams and bulls and putting on a whole garb before they enter into the presence of the lord are you at least making sure that you say lord please forgive me of my sins before i come and chat with you and have a conversation and expect you to dwell with me am i asking the lord to please check my heart posture check my intentions before i wish to dwell in your presence or call you to dwell with me and What's interesting is we see these priests were set apart from the other Israelites, right? And they're called to these priests specifically. Literally, their lives were consecrated and changed. Like every day they would surrender to be in the presence of the Lord. That is how they stewarded the presence of God. That was the price that they paid in order to stay in God's presence. They didn't they didn't do anything of their own desires they had to be clean they had to do these sacrifices they had to eat only what was designated by them from the lord and that was the price that they paid for the presence of the almighty god and this sort of continues on for the history of the israelites um, until jesus comes again just illustrating to you that we started off here establishing that there are priests those priests then were able to have a place to dwell 
um, with the spirit of the Lord, which was the temple. And this temple was known to be like, this is the place that you have to go if you want to have God's presence. It is only in the temple where God's presence was able to dwell. So it's an interesting place to be at looking like now we understand that the Holy Spirit fills us and his presence is with us always. Whereas then if anyone wanted to enter even close to the presence of the Lord, they had to go to the temple. And even then that temple had like one space, which is like the outer courts. Then they had the inner courts. Then they had the holies. Then they had the holies of holies, which is actually where the presence of God dwelt. So there are so many barriers when it came to, first of all, who could dwell with the Lord and how close you could dwell with the Lord. But again, the only individuals who are able to dwell in the presence of the Lord were the ones who paid the price. It was the priests. So that was still going on even in Jesus's time of growing up and throughout his ministry. But after Jesus dies, something amazing happens. When Jesus dies, we see this in Matthew Matthew 27, verses 50 to 51. When he dies, something changes in that the presence of the Lord no longer is just like in that space of the temple. So we see that here in Matthew 27, verses 50 to 51. It says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, which means he died. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple, which is again, that place where only, that was only the place where, you know, God's presence was dwelling. The only person who could really go into the deepest depths of God's presence were the ones who paid the price, the ones who were the priests delineated for this service to dwell in God's presence. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock splits. And what we see in verse 51, this is symbolic. After Jesus, the veil is torn in the temple, which symbolizes the removal of this. These specific people must be in the priesthood lineage to dwell in this this deepest part of the temple where God's presence is. And what's amazing is it's no longer just these small groups of priests that are able to dwell in the presence of the Lord, but this then becomes a heritage for everyone who accepts Jesus Christ. And we see that it's not just the Levites now or their lineage that are priests, but we become the new priests as followers of Christ. And we see this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and verses 9 to 12. So it's we, we, we see that what was once just a priesthood and once was just a calling for a select group of people now becomes we are the new priesthood. So everyone who accepts Jesus Christ not only gets the Holy Spirit, but are called to be priests in Christ. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and see where it says that. We'll start at verse 5. It says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we already see this idea of being a spiritual house, a spiritual house to what? The Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And similar to how those holy priests were only allowed to enter into the temple, into the holies of holies to meet with God, we ourselves are now called to be priests. So you might already be thinking like, okay, if I'm called to be priest, those priests had to do a lot back in the day to consecrate themselves. So am I also called to consecrate myself in a way in order to be a part of this holy priesthood and to be a good spiritual house to the presence of the Lord? Is there a price that I need to pay as a priest in this modern day for God's presence to be a good steward of his presence? Before we end on 1 Peter 2, let's jump down to verse 9 where this is reiterated, this idea of a priesthood. It says here concerning those who follow Christ, who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war for and against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So keep your conduct amongst unbelievers as honorable so that they will speak against you so that when they speak against you as evil doers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So we already see in that first part in verse nine, it's telling us again, You are a set-apart chosen race, a royal priesthood unto God. You are the new priests who now have a new price to pay because you are now holding the presence of God being the Holy Spirit. So we are priests in the priesthood 
similar to the priests of the days of old um, who were in the temple or even before that who were anointed and consecrated in exodus just like those priests we are also called to be consecrated and there is also a price for us to pay so that we can be good stewards of god's presence so in times where we feel far from god ask yourself are you consecrating yourself and being one that would be part of and exhibits the behaviors of someone who's in a holy priesthood what does it mean to exhibit those behaviors well in first peter 2 right after he says you're part of this priesthood he tells you how to exercise that he begins to tell you that in verse 11 it says beloved i urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh so when you're in the priesthood you kill the passions of the flesh that's the first thing. And you want to keep your conduct with unbelievers, those Gentiles, to be honorable. Again, another call for you to be a priest. The old temple is gone. The veil was torn at Jesus' death. The new temple then becomes those who follow Jesus Christ. But every temple needs to have a priesthood. Every temple needs to have a priest in order to upkeep the overall temple. That was the main goal of the priest. They were staying in the temple they were making sure that they were conducting themselves well so that the presence of the Lord would be able to dwell in the temple and then they would receive impartation from the Lord and then that would then be translated to the people. So in the same way, we are now temples of the presence of God and we also have to be good priests to steward that temple, to protect that temple. There was nothing that could come into the temple to defile it because that was the priest's job. They were making sure that the temple was pure so that the presence of the Lord could stay and dwell there. And the price of that was that those priests surrendered their lives to be stewards of the temple. That's all they did. That was their job. Their job was to protect the temple and its purity so that the presence of the Lord could dwell there and the Lord was able to then dwell in the temple and be with his people and bless the people overall, the children of Israel. So the same way the Holy Spirit is in us, we are temples. It is our jobs as priests to pay that price in order to make sure that the temple that the Lord dwells in, that his presence stays in, is pure. So I think sometimes the disconnect comes when we read the Old Testament and we see in Exodus, oh, those priests, they had to do all, they had to do so much stuff. They had to kill animals and they had to be pure and they had to wash themselves. Thank God Jesus came because we don't have to do all that. We could just accept Jesus and the Holy Spirit in us, da 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 But we have to remember that the need for consecration, the need for the price of his presence doesn't go away. Jesus already told us, if you love me, keep his commands. He says that twice as he introduces to us the presence being the Holy Spirit. He introduces to us, hey, this is the Holy Spirit, but if you love me, keep my commands. He says it twice. I think that's intentional. I think he's trying to remind us that, yes, the veil from the temple was torn so we can walk out of this consecration of you must kill seven bulls and six calves and wash yourself clean and only eat unleavened bread to receive the presence of the holy spirit and to dwell with him but there still needs to be a washing of our minds a sacrificing of our wills instead of the physical washing of our hands or the sacrificing of animals we have to wash our minds we have to sacrifice our wills and our desires under the submission of the holy spirit that lives within us within us in our temples so that he can be magnified that he can be glorified and that his presence then becomes amplified amplified when we do less and less of the things that we desire we can be able to do more and more for what of what the lord has asked us to do and the thing is when we don't do that when we don't heed what the what the lord is saying when we don't love him enough to keep his commands we can start to suppress the presence of the Lord. We, we are not paying the price for his presence, which is that submission of our wills and that obedience towards him. And that's when we can start to feel far from him. And there's really two main things that I've encountered in my life that has hindered God's presence. And the first is lack of communion with him. And the second is sin. So first of all, as we establish, let's let's do the lack of communion with God, that first part that can sometimes hinder us from his presence. There is a price of our time, our attention, our efforts when we want to feel the presence of God. We actually need to be in a place where we can actually dwell with him. If we're always working, if we're always doing things, but we're never sitting with the Lord in prayer, which is literally just, it doesn't have to be crazy, 
it can literally just be like, hey, Lord, I love you. Just magnifying him, telling him how wonderful he is, thanking him for all that he's done, not spending time in his word or being open or receptive to seeing what the scriptures have said, not reading the words of Jesus, which tell us how we should live our life and how we can draw close to him. And what's interesting is Jesus is our perfect example. There are so many scriptures throughout the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus would just seclude and he would leave out of the multitudes he would leave from his disciples and we go in a secret place and pray to the lord jesus was being an example of how we can usher in god usher in god's presence he would simply just pray he would find a space and a time where he could talk to his abba father and the thing is with god is it says in psalms 14 the lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand if there are any who seek god So God is always looking for those who he can dwell with. He's always looking for those who are seeking him. He says, seek him and and you'll find him. That is a promise that does not return empty. But if we don't seek him in the prayer, if we don't seek him in the word, if we don't seek him like Jesus does in a secret place to go pray to the father, how can he find someone? How can he be found if, if we're not looking? We're so busy in life looking for other things. And then on the side, we're like, oh, I just feel so far from God. I had such a busy week and I just feel like he wasn't there with me. But did you invite him into your week? Were there moments where you prayed? Were there moments where you just spent time? And it again, like I say this again, because I really used to think that it had to be like, you need to get on your knees and close the door and really just like pray. And that is the only time when you can receive from the Lord or where you can feel his presence. But if you just invite him, like I invite him when I drive, I'll be like, hi, Jesus. Good morning. Let's go for a drive. Grant me traveling mercies this day. But also chat with me. And like he will just, you'll feel his presence. But that only comes when you invite him. That only comes when you pray to him and open that line of communication and communing. And there are moments in life where we feel so busy. And those busy moments are also, they also tend to be the times when we feel furthest from God because in the busyness, we haven't taken the time to invite God into our situations and into our days. But then we wonder why we don't hear from him. We wonder why we don't feel him. But it's like, let's say you miss a friend. If you don't set time to be like, hey, let's go to this coffee shop and spend time together, even if it's just for 30 minutes, then of course you're going to start feeling far and distant from distant from your friend because you're not taking all the time to spend time with them. The easiest way for you to spend time with the person, the easiest way for you to feel someone, the easiest way for you to feel the presence of someone is just to spend time with them. Like when I feel distance from, distant from my friends, I'll take a trip back home and I'll be like, hey, let's go to dinner and be in their presence. But the only way I was able to be in their presence was to open an invitation and set time apart from a busy schedule, your work days, your obligations, just to be like, Lord, I'm going to spend time with you. And he's the type of God. It says Psalms 14 verse 2. It says the Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God, any who make an invitation or appointment, any who go and pray to him, any who invite them, invite him into their day. He's looking for those people. So that promise doesn't return void. He says, seek me and you will find me. But if we are not seekers, how can we expect to experience the presence of God if we are not truly inviting and seeking in his presence? Fair, fair question. I'll never go and invite myself in a place that I wasn't invited. But if I'm welcome somewhere, I'm going to spend all the time. I might not leave. I'm going to spend as much time as possible if I'm invited somewhere and it's a genuine invite and it's not just like obligatory. Like, yeah, let me just pray for today. And hey, God, what's up? How are you doing? That doesn't feel like a welcoming environment for my presence. If someone was like, hey, Leah, what's up? Uh, You can just grab this stuff and go. Yeah, can you just drop off that thing that I asked you for and you could go? Okay, thank you. Yeah, you could just drop off that little spirit of joy. I I just need a little bit of joy and then you can go. Versus a person who says, hey, Leah, how's it going? Let's sit down and talk. I set time aside for you. Let's have dinner together. You know how much more willing I would be to stay in a place and to dwell in a place and to be present in a place if it has been a place that is just a honoring of me and, and, and is a place of love and it isn't a place where there's contingencies on how you're going to feel in God's presence 
or how much you really want to dwell with God. It's like, mm, God really blessed me today. So I'm going I'm to pray for, I'm going to pray to him today. And I'm going to spend a lot of time with him because, you know, he blesses me. I thought my car was breaking down, but he got me through it. He gave me a bonus through my boss. So I'm really going to pray to God this week because thank you, God. You really did that. But in the weeks where things aren't going right, those are the times where like, I got to figure it out on my own. I ain't got time to pray. Because, God, you're not really doing what I need you to do for me. So let me try to figure it out on my own. But it's in those times of struggle where we should have a deeper reliance on the Lord. What is he trying to show you in those moments? But if you don't pay the price of, hey, I'm just going to set aside true time and intentional time to dwell with the Lord. Paying that price of our time, sacrificing that for his presence. In those busy moments where we feel like everything's going wrong, if we are not turning to the Lord, it only just spirals and gets worse and worse and worse. And even worse, the Holy Spirit that lives within us gets more and more diminished because we're not sacrificing the passions of the flesh. Most of the times when things happen, we look to our flesh, we look to ourselves to try and solve it. When we're busy in a week, like I'll admit it, when I was an undergrad, even now as a student, I'll be like, ooh, I can't pray today because I need to study for my test. God understands. But God is the one who will give you the wisdom and the grace in order to recall things on the test. So why would I not speak to him and say, good morning, Jesus. I love you. You see me. You know what I'm going through this day. What is it to lose an hour of studying and cramming for a test that you have later that day? Wouldn't you rather just use that hour to spend time with the Lord, who is your Prince of Peace, who gives all things unto your remembrance if you ask of him? But if you don't dwell in his presence, you're not you're unable to walk into your day with that authority. And that's why we have these cycles of anxiety, because we let the circumstances we we pay the price of our time and our communion and our thoughts and our energy to the circumstances that aren't serving us well. But we don't pay that price of our time and our energy and our communion to the Lord who can fix everything in a moment. And then we're like, why am I so stressed out and anxious and every day just feels so I'm scared. Because we don't come to the Lord in the first place or we come to the Lord and in his presence with a, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? Instead of saying, Lord, I just am here. I want to say that I thank you for just being the God of the universe, for giving me the breath of life this day. Now, oh Lord Jesus, help me with these circumstances. I'm not going to come to you barking orders. I'm going to say, Lord, in your presence, help me with these circumstances in the only way that you can and show me how to deal with these circumstances in the way that you want me to. Not, Lord, this is the way that I want to deal with them, so you need to work it out my way. But when I come into the presence of the Lord, I'm sacrificing the wills of my flesh. That's the price that I'm paying to sit in his presence and allow him to download into me. Not contingent on anything of the expectations that I have. So that's the first one. Are you communing with God? If you feel like you're dwelling far away from his presence, is there a communion that you're having with the Lord? The second is, are you sinning? Again, going back to John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And sin is one of the biggest ways to draw us away from the Lord. Sin can distract us and also just put us in places where we're unable to be with the Lord. In John 1, verse 1, uh, John 1, chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, it reminds us that light and darkness can't mix. The presence of the Lord and your sin and your fleshly desires cannot mix. You can think about it as like sin and your fleshly desires and you fulfilling your sin versus the presence of God are like oil and water. They don't mix. Literally, based on like the hydrogen component of both of these things, they literally physically cannot mix together. Like it just doesn't work. And the same is said for the potency and the strength of God's presence and the Holy Spirit within you and when you're sinning. It's like you're trying to pour oil into water and be like, God, why can't I hear you? But he's like, you got all this water in here. I'm oil. I physically cannot dwell in the same place. I cannot be as potent in the same place where you have water around me where you have sin in john 1 chapter 1 verse 5 to 7 it says this is a message we have heard from him and declare to you god is light in him there is no darkness at all there's no sin if we claim to have fellowship with him if we claim to be in his presence yet walk in darkness we lie and do not live out the truth so there's no way that we can claim to have fellowship with the presence of god but yet walk in darkness and in sin 
we lie and do not tell the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us all from all sin. The key takeaway, like it said in First Peter, it reminded us, kill the passions of your flesh. If you don't, those passions of your flesh turn into sin. Those sins cannot dwell with the light of God. God is light, sin is darkness, choose one. If you want the presence of God, if you want to claim to have fellowship with him, you drop the sin. You have to drop the darkness to allow the light to illuminate your body, to be a true presence in your body. And you know what's crazy too? It's not just visceral sin. And this is a whole other, this is a whole other thing. But it's also the media that we consume. Is the media edifying what 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 would if 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 Jesus people say this all the time, if Jesus was sitting in the room, would he like what you were watching or what you were listening to? But it is the same idea. If you're if you want to be a steward to the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Lord, what are you letting enter the temple? Remember, we're we're the temples. And it's a priest's job to make sure that the temple has nothing to defile it, so that the spirit and the presence of God can be potent. So are we being a a priesthood that is not ensuring that our temple where the Holy Spirit dwells, are we are we being bad stewards of the temple as priests? Are we letting things in our ears, our eyes, into our bodies in general that do not please the Lord, that defile our temple and thus diminish the presence of the Lord? There were a lot of things that I watched that I had to give up. I had to surrender because... I knew good and well, and I would feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit that presence to the Lord being like, this is not what needs to be consumed in your temple. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I know, but I'm still going to watch it. And then the more and more that I watched it, it then ends up being like, oh, how did I fall into the sin again if I have the Holy Spirit in me? Because you're diminishing the Holy Spirit, and instead you're allowing things to defile your temple. You're allowing in the spirit of lust. You're allowing in the spirit of anger and strife and confusion and conflict and conflict into your temple. So now you're trying to get the Holy Spirit, the light, with all this darkness, all these other spirits that are not of him. Choose one, oil and water, don't mix. And that's where we have this confusion and this contingency. We have this confusion in our hearts, like, why am I still acting the way that I'm acting? But the Holy Spirit is inside me. What are you consuming? What are the practices of your life? Are those things that are edifying to the Lord? Are you keeping your temple clean? That is the price of his presence. Are you examining your life and saying, Okay, I want the presence of the Lord, the price I need to pay. Maybe I got to cut out the the Real Housewives. Uh Uh-oh. Maybe I got to stop listening to Drake. Uh Uh-oh. Maybe I got to let it go. And it's hard. That's hard to do because those are desires of your flesh. I get it. That's hard to do. But it's the price of his presence. It's a price. Price, things that costs you. It's not easy. If we claim to have fellowship, it says, yet we walk in darkness, we live a lie. If you claim to want to have this presence of the Holy Spirit, but you don't pay the price of surrendering your sin and your fleshly desires, you're living a lie. That's not me. That's the word, John 1, John 1, 1, verse 6. Not me. You could read it. Um, and what we don't understand is that The things that we do, if we do it contrary to the Lord, it can grieve the Holy Spirit. It can grieve the Holy Spirit. It can hinder the Holy Spirit. In the way that we act, if we don't let go of our tendencies, it can grieve the Holy Spirit. And that thus then diminishes the potency of his presence within us. When we don't pay the price for his presence, someone something has to give. So if we're giving way to sin then we're not giving the Holy Spirit and God's presence the reverence that it needs. Like, it's a tug of war and you're letting one side win. But expecting the other side to just be like, oh, no, it's good. I'm I'm, I'm going to still be here as strong as I was yesterday after you did X, Y, Z. No. In Ephesians um, chapter 4, starting at verse 29, it talks about how when we do things out of sin, it can grieve the Holy Spirit within us. It can 
diminish that presence of the Lord that dwells within our temples. It says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for the building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another and tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit that we were given on that day of redemption when we have accepted the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. How do we not grieve him? Not only by loving him and keeping his commands, but we see in Ephesians, it talks about letting go of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander. So even the things that we do outwardly to other people can then begin to grieve and diminish the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And it is our jobs as this new holy priesthood to make sure that our temples and dwellings are pure. So what does it take to dwell? If we understand, okay, we're the new holy priesthood, we need to do well. Sometimes we don't when we don't commune with God, when we don't surrender and sacrifice, and also when we are letting sin run rampant. Those are things that can hinder his presence. But what can we do to pay the price of God's presence? One of the best examples of this is David, because David was a man after God's own heart. And his biggest cry, we can see this in uh, Psalms 51, he says, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. He was literally pleading to the Lord, even despite sin and not being perfect. His main desire was, Lord, do not take your spirit from me. Do not let your presence go away from me. So I like to turn to the Psalms because the Psalms are the words of David. He's telling us, he's asking these questions about who can dwell with the Holy Spirit, who can dwell in the holy place of the Lord, who can dwell in the presence of the Lord. And there are answers to this in the scripture. So for example, David writes in Psalms 24, if we go to verse three, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? So who can dwell in the presence of the Lord? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol or swear by a false God. So this idea of having a pure heart, what does it mean to be one who has a pure heart as spoken about in David? Jesus reminds us about this idea of being pure in heart with the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. He says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. They shall be in his presence. So we're seeing again, Old Testament and New Testament, this important of being in pure heart standing in order to see God, to dwell God, in order to be good stewards of his presence. So what is the character of those who are pure in heart? To be cleaned, we need to be cleaned by the Holy Spirit. We need to be... um, checking our hearts by the word so that we can allow for the presence of God to change us. It's almost like this positive feedback loop where it says the ones who will see God will be pure in heart. So you have this, you need to make sure that you are living right. You're loving God. You're keeping his commands that places you in his presence. But then his presence also just regurgitates and like reinforces the things that you've already been doing so to get to the presence of god we need surrender of our will and our fleshly desires we need to spend time with him and then when we're in the presence of god that just reinforces wanting to spend more time with him wanting to surrender more of our will to him wanting to sin less and less and it just becomes a feedback loop of allowing us to have a potency a strength of god's presence that we didn't have before before paying that price And David, that man after God's own heart heart, that never left God's presence, he was always, always, always asking for a clean heart, a pure heart. Again, in that same chapter of Psalms, in Psalm 51, where he says, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. He also says, Lord, give me a clean heart and a pure heart. So we see this cycle of clean heart and a pure heart places us in the presence of the Lord. And then the presence of the Lord also refines in us a clean and a pure heart. And it just keeps going and going and going. And David shows us in his life example that the best way, even if we sin, is to return to God with this heart and this desire to have a clean and pure heart. And again, remember, the Lord is searching for those who seek him. Not those who are perfect and seek him, but those who understand that they are imperfect. And the only way that they can live this life is through him and through his presence dwelling within them and the potency of his presence and listening and hanging on each word that he speaks. So if you're questioning, why do I feel far from the Lord? If you're questioning, why do I feel so off about things? 
ask yourself, how have you been living? What is your heart posture? Have you been actually making the time for God? Are you sitting? Are you doing things that you know are not creating an environment that the Lord would dwell? Because light and darkness cannot dwell together. Oil and water cannot mix. So which one are you choosing? And it takes sacrifice and surrender. Like, you're going to have to probably maybe surrender. Yeah, yeah, you might have to let Drake go. Probably do. Yes, I'm actually telling you, you do need to let Drake go. Because what Drake, is Drake talking about anything edifying of the Holy Spirit? Or is he talking about things that would grieve the Holy Spirit? What did it say in Ephesians? It said in Ephesians, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you. It also says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths. Does Drake have some corrupt talk oh he definitely has some corrupt talk and what does corrupt talk do it grieves the holy spirit so if i'm listening to an artist that has corrupt talk but then i'm like oh why do i feel so far from the presence of god because that's grieving his spirit the price of his presence let go of drake aubrey you gotta go he gotta go champagne poppy gotta go trust me trust me girl i did it i did it and i'm from toronto so those roots they run deep i had to let him go um, I had to let go of the housewives. I couldn't watch this. Up. That, that's clamoring, wrath, anger, and corrupt talk. Grieve in the spirit. Gotta let it go. Cause I want the presence. That's the price. I wake up at five o'clock in the morning just so I can spend time with the Lord at least an hour. That's the price of His presence. I've let go desires and sins and people that have led me to sin to get closer to the Lord. That's the price of God's presence. So it's hard. I'm praying that the Lord will give you grace as you do this and strength and courage to do it because sometimes it's hard to cut certain things or people off that you know are hindering God's presence. But let us be, O Lord Jesus, a holy priesthood set apart for your glory and those who would do all that they can to make sure that this temple, the temple of their heart stays pure so that your presence can dwell and be potent within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video excuse me, this video, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, be blessed. Jesus loves you. Oh, and the scriptures are in the description box. So go read them. Test it by the word. God is good. Amen. Bye.